Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. Today we got a special piece of kit here. This is uh, a motherboard. Might not look like one. You might think it is a, it's a industrial CPU board or a backplane. But if we look closely here on the uh, I say slot, slot here or connector, there are no pins on it. On either side is completely blank so this is actually an upgrade board for an ordinary PC and the way this works is if you take a motherboard like this it's a 486 board a dead one and you simply put your upgrade board in to one of the ISA slots here bit finicky there. So, then you end up with something like this. And the idea here is to move over your power connectors for a power supply, add RAM, add a CPU, hook up your hard drives and optical units and floppy and so on. And basically have a new computer in your old 286 or newer ISA based machine. So it basically turns the motherboard into the old one into a glorified holder for your new motherboard. So this card is a Renaissance 370S from a Power Leap. So it's a system on a board. So we have uh, under here we got the SIS 630E chipset. It's a SOC, so it contains pretty much everything you need. Except probably we got the network over here, uh, Realtek 8139. Uh, I'm not sure about sound if that might be what's over here. We have the sound header here, but this should contains like your IDE connector, connection for your IDE, floppy, everything, including 2D and 3D graphics. So it has an, a built-in IGP. I don't think this one supports. Uh, Dedicated VRAM, the 630 is supposed to do that. This is the E version. I don't think it has any support for that. It was rarely used apparently. So I think this removed that on the later revisions. So it uses uh, RAM for VRAM. And it supports uh, Celerons and Pension 3, Socket 370. I'm not sure about Talatins. Uh, my friend said it supports it, but uh, there's nothing in the manual about it. So. And we can opt for either 80 power or 80x power. And here on the back we got PS2 ports, keyboard and mouse, USB and network. And everything else we need breakout cables for. So we got the game port and uh, audio here. This one I don't remember. These are COM ports here, floppy and uh, ID. And we've got USB over here, X2 extra ports, infrared. So jumper over here that is not in the manual for some reason. Also this board here, this cap here, probably hard to see because it's so minute, but this thing has started to bulge, so the caps are probably going right now. So this thing needs a recap, but the bigger issue with this thing is this monstrosity of a bodge job. I haven't actually tried the card out. It's supposed to be working, but with very fuzzy picture. <laughs> I wonder why. I don't know why they removed the header and uh, done this to it, but that's what the eBay seller did. So yeah. So the, the first thing that this new board needs is a new header and a proper adapter for the BJ. And then a figured sound, so we can actually here are some tunes. So here on the monitor we got one of those adapters. I don't have one right now. But I don't think we need one. We can reuse parts of the old one. And the bracket is not, not an issue and we got the VDA connector. What's missing is the flat cable which is a non-issue. 
So what we need to fix this is so we need to make a new adapter for the VDA. You can buy one, but uh, I bought a whole bunch of these uh, connectors for flat cables. And that cost almost nothing, so I got a bunch of those. Got some flat cables. Uh, got some headers. We might not be able to use them. I haven't tried, but these are keyed, so that's nice. You can't turn it the wrong way if you put it in the right way the first time. And we got this plastic shroud to cover up the end here later once we get this done properly. So if we take a look on my monitor here, we can see one of those adapters. And there's nothing with old things like this that says this is standard by any means. It could be custom pin out or something. So I've been measuring around here. So we can take a look here. If we zoom in here on the actual... spot where this is supposed to go, which is over here. We got the first row is 2 to 16, so we've got the, the even row up on the top. And then we got, um, let's see, 1, 2, 15 here. So they basically go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So, we look at my monitor here on this adapter. There's a pinout for it here, for the board, uh, and for the adapters, the VGA. And it's the opposite on the actual board here, but that depends on what which way you view things too. So. so we can quite easily make a comparison and check what he has done here. So we zoom out again a little bit. We have this here, and we can compare. So. Number one, if we put this like that, number one should be over, let's see, it should be over here, top corner here. And number one is over here. So we can check that, is that actually is the same as on the monitor? And we got a good beep there. So without boring you too much, this checks out. So we got, if we look at the middle row, that goes six to, uh, six to 10. And we also bring up, a pinout for that. Uh, let's see here. Media 2 here. We've got another image here. 6 to 10. It's basically ground. Uh, 9 is not connected, which is true for this board. It's over here. Uh, that shouldn't matter. So we can see here with all the soldering mask here, all the, where, uh, the yellow area here is all the ground. So it's uh, 1, 2, Three, four, five. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then we skip nine, ten. And if we check those, they are all obviously connected because they're grounded. We can check them against the ground, the board, and we could also check them here. So. From what I can see, this is us basically the same pinout as the adapter on the picture here that I showed you here. So we can use this as a guide to hook everything up properly. So yeah, the next thing is actually to do that so we can actually test the board to see if we have any good image on it and all the colors and all of that. So the first thing to do is to remove this board job. I'm using a pretty big tip here, but that's uh, just to get heat in more easily. I don't know why he hooked it up the way he did, I have no clue, but this seems kind of unnecessary in every way what he's done.
now I will clean all this up. I think the holes are clean now. They were a bit stubborn, but uh, some new lead, lead solder and the big tip, tip really helps with the heat to get the, the heat in there because it's, uh, it's a lot of copper on both sides. So. And preheating it with the hot air station a little bit. Can you use a heat gun or something like that cheaper for just preheating a little bit? I got up like 85C on the board in that particular area for heating. You can probably go higher, but that helped too. So I just have to clean this area now. And inspect the holes, make sure we haven't missed anything. are clean so we can mount a header there as you can see if I do like this my hand behind it so we can move on to actually making a uh, we want to make an actual adapter for this so I'm gonna start by having a look at this so you can figure out where the pins go Oops, so we put it on the right way So one is at the bottom here, and according to this, if I put it with the notch down, it sure looks like, yeah, so if the notch is down like these next to it, this notch is here, uh, pin one would be there on this connector here. So we need to make a ribbon cable is 15 wide. I don't think we need only like 12. A lot of the new cards, like, like a modern, recent modern cards, only have 12 wires on their adapters for some reason. But that's because a few of them are not connected. Uh, one is optional and two are not connected, if I recall. So I think I want the uh, VGA header over here and a bracket here, close as possible away, just in case I want USB because that header is down here on the board. 
So we should put this in here. This is this header here is 2 by 8, so it's a 16, and the cable is 15. So we make sure we got the cable all the way to the to the one two pin, so we don't end up uh, with it one off. So I had to press it in place with the vise. It's a bit difficult by hand. And then you bend this thing over, obviously. I think I'm gonna cut the excess off first to make it look good. So it's nice to have this extra piece on top here. Don't remember if the original ones usually have that, but uh, since I want to make it rounded, because that adapter is rounded, I could have find one that has the straight opening at uh, with, the, with the connector. Found one that was round, so I figured make a rounded cable. So now we got that end sorted. So this is one the red one, and then we got one, two, three, and so on. So you really just need to hook these up from one to fifteen according to the diagram I showed you of that adapter on that picture, and it should work in theory. So this is gonna end up somewhere around here. Might be a bit long though, but it tends to be get, get a little bit short when you round them off. So yeah, but we could solder the header into place, I think, now on the board so we can actually test fit everything. So I'm gonna open this bag here, and see how this fits. If that doesn't fit, we have to go this style here, the traditional one. But since there's no key here on uh, at all, I could make a key. I could probably take out pin nine and uh, uh, put some epoxy in that connector to make it a key, because that's basically what a lot of those diagrams or pinouts tells you. So I figured this would go here, and then that seems to be a no-go because for some reason this is too wide. But maybe we can do it anyway, just cut one side off a bit. Would look a little bit stupid, but it should fit anyway, because the original one is the same solution and fits, so... I think we have to cut one side off here. So, maybe not the best looking solution, but I think it still looks better than I used time on these headers, and it's, it should be safer for the reason that you can't turn it the wrong way now, even if that side is missing, it's, but it blends together with the, the comfort pretty well, so I think we'll go with this. So let's solder that in place. I took the big tip because of this ground plane here was a bit stubborn. Can do two at once here now. Small 1.6 just isn't good enough all the time. And that's a bridge we don't want. Next thing is to see how this connector fits where I put it here. So this will go like so nicely. So like I said, there's nothing special this connector at all. But I figured uh, if I want to, to buy one, the only one I can find was in the US. It wasn't particularly expensive, but the shipping and the, to uh, the customs and all that and the time to get it. So it was cheaper and easy just to make my own and get it the way I want. So next thing is to 
desolder all of this. Probably gonna take a small tip once we build it up again so you can get to them easy. Right now it's not that important. More important to get some heat in so you can get the cables off. So, old crappy cables. So yeah, let's look at this one. And it uh, looks fine. So, to run this thing up, I figured we use some sleeving. So I figure we use uh, something like this. It's a piece of sleeving. So, I figured we, we open up all the way to here, so that's why good we have this piece over here. We can split them all the way down there. And obviously you need some of this free up here, so this thing is going to be a little bit shorter than the, than the actual... Actual ribbon cable, something like that. You're gonna see some piece of ribbon in one end, uh, that's for sure, but that's fine. We can live with that. And we can cover some up, some will be covered up by the shrink wrap, obviously. So, my plan now is to basically take one at a time and stick it through this and, uh, and, and these. I think I'll stick these on here first if I can, so they are on, so I know where they are. Good thing with the uh, this kit here is actually split in half, so we can put it on afterwards. Otherwise, if we, if we have the traditional one and we forget it, we have an issue. So, hopefully, we can get to the middle ones later. Should be doable. Might be easy to start with those in reality, but uh, I don't want to mess, uh, but mix the cables up. So I think I tried it this way. I'll learn until next time. That's the fun thing with this hobby is that you have to try things out and figure it out yourself. Well, to some extent, it's a lot of information on the internet, but in the end, you have to do what works for you. Figure it out. So here we have it. It's obviously not finished yet because there's no reason to shrink wrap all of this and so on before we tested it out. So I had to shrink wrap that wire a little bit because uh, it got a bit frayed. So, but the plan is to like put this on over here, something like so comes out like that and that over there so and then put that uh, plastic shroud on but now we actually have something we can test so we can actually see if we have a working board because I don't know if that thing works so that's the next thing to do so we have everything hooked up VGA adapter we got an ATX power supply with an AT adapter 
and uh, got the keyboard connected. So it's time to try it out. Power leap renaissance. So let's press D here. So we are in the BIOS and uh, it looks like the col colors are all there. Yellow, blue, and then we have white, so that should be all the colors. So yeah, 2001 it's not, but uh, I suppose the board was made pretty late. And since it's socket 270, I think this came out somewhere around that year. So yeah, it seems like we have a working board. So let's see. Uh, I'm 28 mega RAM, I just took a stick and it works. Same thing about the CPU, balanced. T2. There we go. Now so we can set the timings, that's nice. And have a decent stick that can go pretty tight somewhere. I don't know what kind of sound card it is, but this almost looks like uh, say a MIDI. I play Sound Blaster 16 compatible. And we can go up to 64 megabytes shared memory. So if you put like 512 megs of RAM in this thing, I have one, uh, a couple of those sticks, we could quite easily set it to 64. 32 should be enough for anything, but uh, yeah. Problem is gonna be the, the memory bandwidth is like one gigabyte per second. A good two is like two gigabyte per second, and this is shared between the IGP and the CPU. The health here, oh, 1.65 volts, which is correct for the CPU. Oh, you can see voltage on the meter. I don't know. There's none installed. Yeah, pretty nice fan, but the bearings are good, so that's good. Doesn't seem to be any real overclocking out above 133, but that's fine, I'm not gonna overclock this thing. And there's no unlock CPUs, so yeah, that's it for the BIOS. So we can move on to recapping, and uh, before we do that, we should finish up this adapter and add, add an audio jack and make a nice IO bracket, so that's gonna be next. Uh, Finishing up the adapters and brackets. The camera wasn't on when I put this together, but this is the finished adapter. So, yeah, not much to say really. It's just an adapter with a rounded cable. But I think it worked out quite nice. Uh, made a hole here for the audio. I'm gonna add an audio act later so we can have some audio out. So yeah, I think that's the next thing to do, and after that is recapping. So, we need to make an audio adapter. And the reason why we need to make all these adapters is because the ones included are either, like the VGA one, broken and not original, and the other ones are not original either. And the audio one, I couldn't even find. So, that's why. So this is the audio jack, or normal 3.5mm stereo plug. So my plan is to use these two wires here, network wires. So white for ground, so two grounds, and then we add in the end here, we add some uh, connectors, two of them. Because the way that it works on the card here, well, on the card we have two bottom pins are left and right channel and the two above are ground so having two plugs we can swap the channels if we get them the wrong way. 
So we begin by adding the grounds here. So there is our adapter. We connect it here now. So let's see here. It should hook up. And like so. Um, and that is about it. According to the manual, that's where the audio left and right is at the bottom and ground is on top. And ground is white in my case. And then we have a VGA. So go something like that. So now with all the important stuff when it comes to I/O and externally. So next thing to do is to recap this board. So here on my monitor, you can see the board, and I have have marked up all the caps, their values and positions. I usually do that before I order them so i know what to order first and then i can use it as a reference when recapping so basically basically i can take them all off if i want and i know where they go and also if you look carefully we can see the white line on the right side usually 
a board has an orientation for the negative pole. So when the board is in this orientation, it's to the right or east. We can also have a vertical orientation. So you can have, say, if, for example, east and south if they have to. There are also boards where there is no real order, where there are exceptions. You should always pay attention to that. But on this particular board, I haven't found an exception to the rule. You could obviously also mark up the orientation. And I do have a marker telling me if white is negative or positive. That can also differ. So the white half of the circle on the PCB could be positive sometimes. That happens. In this case, it's negative, which is easy enough. Also, when you buy caps after you made a list like this, you don't have to, for example, to get uh, the 6.3 volt at uh, 1500 AU. You got 15 of those. You can get the 10 volt version if you want. I uh, usually, what I usually do if two caps are basically the same dimensions and capacity, but one is, for example, 10 volts and one is 6.3, I go with the 10 volts all over when I order. So you can always operate the voltage uh, like a step. That's not an issue. Shouldn't change the capacity though. And size wise, height isn't an issue as long as nothing interferes with it. So you have to pay attention around uh, expansion slots like your PCI, ISA, and ADP, for example. I've made a poo poo once by mistake, not checking the height. Otherwise, uh, you can always go with slightly higher ones if that's what you can find. It's not too uncommon that the caps are smaller than you can buy. I don't know if they, sh you know, they are cheating with the specifications or not. Uh, so sometimes uh, going high, going a taller one is the only option. So yeah, with this board now we're gonna basically remove all the old caps. That's uh, easier and then clean the board so we can start putting new ones back in so before I start removing them I'm gonna preheat the board in the area to help uh, help with the solder melting you can also preheat the caps a bit so I'm pretty low on temperature here we don't, we don't want to cook anything plastic or components just want to get some uh, basic heat into it and even the caps could do with some heat, it will help, so they don't act as heat sinks as much. I'm using a pretty big tip here, because it's, it gets heat into the board a lot easier than a small tip. And we're gonna add some new solder too, it's also gonna help. So that's one out. This board is pretty crammed with stuff. Oops, that it went fast. Pretty crammed with uh, SMDs and things because it's so compact.
Nu har den alltså rabbit of heat does. I'm considering all the SMDs next to them, that was helpful. So, we have removed all the caps, I think. If I missed one, we'll f we will find it later. Uh, next thing I need to do is actually clean out all the holes. Because this is so tightly integrated, as you could probably see, there's a lot of SMD stuff really close to the caps, which is uh, well unusual compared to a normal motherboard. But I suppose that's just the nature of this beast. So that will be next to clean all the holes. I will probably mount it vertically, like this. One of my stands I usually do, because then I can get with the suction from one side and uh, heat from another one. And that usually works quite well. Also with so much ground plane here, uh, everywhere. On both sides it uh, can be quite hard to get uh, the solder to melt all the way through without preheating. So that's why it's good to have some form of hot air station or heat gun or something. To heat the board up a bit, like uh, A to C helps a lot compared to Ambient 22. So that's next to clean the holes, so we can actually mount the new caps. So, I'm gonna clean the holes, and the way I usually do this is with the board upright. I usually desolder that way too, it's easier for me to see on both sides. Uh, unlike what I did before, but since we want it on camera, my working position is not ideal. So, but to actually be able to clean this I can't get under with uh, this thing, so. You're gonna have to guess how it looks, but basically we put this up to a hole on this side and we hit from the other side. And we want to hit from the side with the big uh, copper plane. So, so we, have, we have two holes via us and we want to hit on the side with all the copper. And it also helps to preheat the board again if, uh, if it's annoying. Get out and this will take some time. And since this is upright you can't see that much, uh, you probably won't actually see me doing much of it. So I've cleaned the holes, let's see here if you can see, and let's see here, you should see on the top there, my hand, you should be able to see that, so all the holes are clean. So I'm just gonna go over them now with some wick and uh, flux and so on. 
to make sure uh, we don't have any residue around the holes. So I'm going to be cleaning it first a little bit here, so we don't have all the crud uh, getting stuck under the caps. There's some flux in the tin I've been using obviously, and in the solder wick that could be conductive. The Amtec flux in the syringe is no clean, so it's not conductive, so you can leave that. But since we have a mix, we're better off cleaning a little bit first. So that will do for now. So because I have my picture of uh, the board with the caps and where they go, it should be pretty easy to put them back. And I actually start with the big ones. I prefer that. Because the small ones is quite easy, if you grip them with the thumb or something by accident, you can rip them off again. Uh, the legs uh, on those aren't as sturdy, they're more prone to detach from the cap, so tend to start big and go small usually. So I don't have to handle it as much with the, with the small ones. So I got a bag here of 16 caps uh, out of the 15 we need, uh, 1500 uh, microfarad, 10 volts, 105C, and these are worth German caps. So we should open the bag. So I finally got a rail cutter here. It's uh, an angle on it, and it's. Uh, the lowest point is the jaw, the edge here, so you can get all the way down and snip things instead of uh, this, instead of the, this big hunking thing, because it has a uh, the edge is further in here, so that's kind of annoying, hard to get with that. So I got a Knipex, a proper one for this particular task. It's made for electronics cutting legs and you should cut above the solder joint not through the joint so I'm gonna use it to cut myself some caps and on this particular board white uh, the negative white stripe goes to uh, the white on the board so it's fairly straightforward on this one like I said it can actually be the opposite so I have to be cautious about that I actually think these are taller too than the original ones and they're higher voltage, 10 volts, which is fine. I really don't care about the height on the caps because the board is not one uh, like one slot, like one height because of the cooler and RAM, if nothing else. So you always end up using two slots with this card at the very minimum. So it's fine that the caps are a bit taller than the original from that point of view. 
So there should be all of the big ones. So let's put them in their place. Also, before we could use the 4.8 millimeter tip now, when we need to get stuff back with all the small SMD stuff around and so on, we need to use a smaller one so it's not going to be as able to put heat into the board. So that's all the big cap uh, caps done, the first round here, so I'm just going to snip the legs off so they're not in the way. That's the first round of caps. Let's see. So So there you have it, uh, we have recapped the board. So I'm gonna clean it now properly. So if you saw my Pentium Pro video, you know I'm gonna give it a good wash and clean and then I'm gonna inspect it for any short or other faults that might have occurred due to me recapping it before we try to power it on again. So yeah, that's the next thing to do. So we're back here again. And we have the card out of the oven of some air drying. I think it came out pretty well. Here, yeah, see if you can see. So I inspected uh, the solder joints. I can't find any shorts or uh, any damaged SMC, SMD caps or anything around them or resistors. And I have mes measured the uh, the AT connector here, just to make sure we don't have like any short or anything, and seems fine. So I'm gonna bring it up to the camera here and see if we can find some solder joints for you to see. So we got some here, and then we got some here. And let's see, we got some in the middle over here. So yeah, I'll let you be the judge of this. But I think it came out pretty well considering how uh, this board acts like a heat sink when trying to solder. So yeah, I think it's time for the smoke test, which means hooking it up to the power supply. So that will be the next thing to do. So it's time to see if it posts and works. So I'm gonna switch on the power here. A post so we can get into BIOS. Got into BIOS, nice. So, yeah, I'm gonna set the date and time here then, and uh, I'm gonna fix a boot drive. I think I have a compact flash card we can install Windows 98 on. Uh, so, I will do that set up the BIOS and install Windows 98 to a compact flash, assuming that goes well. So, we can run some benchmarks 
I think we've seen enough of operating system installs for now anyways. So we're back here again and I have installed Windows 98 on a compact trash card but before we boot Windows I want to go over a thing here in the BIOS. So we go here and then we can check advanced DMRAM control 1 here. And I set auto configuration to manual. We can select 100 uh, also auto and 100 MHz and 133 MHz which I figure are memory speeds. So if you select 133, we get the different set of timings like SDRAS active time 6T, SDRAM pre charge time 3T, and so on. And if you select 100, raster cast goes down from 4 to 3T. So the way I figure this works is that uh, you select what you want your memory to run it, but that's not the case it seems because if I go manual like I did before there's no option for memory free frequency and if I benchmark the bandwidth 100 is faster than 133 and uh, the only difference other than the stated frequency is the timings are lower than 100 that probably based off the memory's SPD profile so we can go out here to to advance control timings to here yeah I can also set things like SDRAM uh, VCM CAS latency, so that's the CAS latency I set up to 2. You can go by SPD or manually to T or 3T. So I figured over here in frequency and voltage control we could set the memory speed and we kinda can. We can go to, I think it's here. Here, it's a to default now, but you can select, uh, it says host SDRAM PCI. So CPU host is the CPU, so for example 6, 6 MHz FSB, 100 MHz RAM and 33 MHz PCI. The thing is, there's no setting for 133 MHz memory. The, the highest we can go is 133 CPU bus and 100 MHz memory. So it seems like the memory is actually stuck at 100 MHz at the highest. And I have looked through the PDF, the datasheet for the SIS 630 chipset, but it's 400 pages long. But I do have the SIS 530, which is a Super Socket 7 chipset that can actually do officially 133 MHz bus and 133 MHz PC, 133 memory. But that chip has a small uh, caveat to it, is that if you use the onboard IGP, because that also has an onboard IGP, like the SIS 630, and the caveat there is that if you have it enabled, you can only run officially 110 megahertz on the memory. And uh, I have never been able to get above 112 on that. I suspect the 630 is doing either the same thing or this BIOS board doesn't allow 133 on the memory for whatever reason. And uh, if it's the same as the SIS 530, it kind of makes sense not to even have an option in the BIOS because you have no upgrade pad, you can't disable the IGP or replace it with like a PCI card or something. And also on the 530, I know you need to disable it with a jumper, it needs to be physically disabled according to the PDF for that chipset and uh, my other board doesn't even have that, so I can't even run 130 mesh on that even with a separate card. So that's uh, one thing here. It's a bit annoying because I was hoping to run 130 MHz memory and 130 MHz bus, which I am obviously because that's the CPU I have. So we'll boot into Windows now and uh, have a little look at performance. Though it does run uh, CAS2 and the uh, subtimings are 224 and some other timings are set to the lowest, so it's as slow as it gets. It's mem I run mem test 86 on it. So that it, it helps a lot with the performance though, uh, manually tuning it actually. I went from, I think the 136 setting was on average 208 megabytes per second and the uh, 100 megahertz setting was 108, 218 megabytes per second and uh, with everything tuned manually to the lowest timings I'm at uh, 248 megabytes per second and that is reflected in actual 
performance in benchmarks in games. So we can run some Quake 2, I figured. If I can find it, I'll probably have, have it here somewhere. Quake 2. Now let's run a time demo here. This is tweaked also with some custom configs, so it's not how it would be out of the box. With uh, such a limited amount of performance in that GPU, you really have to tweak everything. So we got 46.4 frames. I think we can get a little higher. We usually get higher on the second run, like 47, 48. But that's fine now. So I'm running 512 by 384. That seems to be the ideal resolution for this card. It starts to tank yeah, quite hard already, 640 by 480. So that seems to be the best resolution in most games. You, you gain a bit by going down, but then you lose so much image quality. And talking of image quality, you can configure the car to be a little bit faster in uh, the settings for the drivers. So you can go here to 3D settings, I think it is, and then yeah, here you have a slider, so you have like quality, low, and speed high here. So the second lowest quality and the, uh, and the second highest speed. Going lower there doesn't help it seems, anything, but the, the, everything looks really, really bad. Yeah, the, so going to the second lowest quality setting gives you the, basically the best performance with uh, reasonably good quality image, if you can call this quality. Uh, Quake 2 is also a bit stuttering when you play by a um, single player, so it's not perfectly smooth despite the frame rate being decent. Quake 3 here now is actually a fair bit smoother, smoother and faster. This is also highly tweaked, so I would expect 15 to 18 FPS on time demo like this out of the box from reviews I saw of the card or the IGP. So this is a lot faster than you would see in a review. This is also 512 by 384. And re reducing the texture quality to the lowest also helps a bit because of the limited memory bandwidth. We don't want to have big textures, we need to move back and forth. So let's check. I've got 60.8 FPS and I usually get 61, so that's fine. The 60 FPS perfectly playable. So yeah. We can have a look at some other benchmarks here. Freedom Mark 2000, here is Freedom Mark 2000 with the 132 MHz profile in the BIOS. It gave me 617 points at uh, the standard setting of 1024 by 768 resolution. So this is like what you should compare with. So that's pretty slow, I must say. Then I did the run here. I'm just gonna through them all, but I did a couple of runs with the tighter timings. So I did an 800 by 600 run with the tighter timings we have now. Because that's what you can run on a Woody 2, you can't run the higher resolution anyway. So I got 1322, 1322 points with the 2224 timings. And I have a K6 2 Plus ring that's about 600. When I run it, that it's 570 with a 112 megabit bus on the SIS 530 with a Voodoo 2 that is overclocked to like 105. I get like 100 and 1500 points. So it's it's a bit slower than a Voodoo 2, definitely. It's somewhere between a Voodoo 1 and a Voodoo 2, I would say, this card. So we can also look at 3D Mark 
99 and I'm not I'm just gonna look at the tweaked score here now so with the with the tweet we get 2836 points we lose like 200 ish points if we run uh, with the 133 megahertz profile so that's a pretty decent score that runs pretty well actually so it definitely doesn't it doesn't seem to like too new stuff and uh, we can check this of Sandra here as you can see we got 211 megabyte and 243 megabytes per second so it's pretty slow but uh, I don't know if the, it supports memory interleaving or not I know the sys 530 doesn't so I suspect the sys 630 might not either so that would explain the pretty low numbers so that doesn't help the IDP either And I also took a screenshot here in Unreal Tournament 99 with one of my demos and we averaged 42.75. actually ran better than I figured, but I wouldn't call it super playable. It's, I mean, you can play it. It, uh, it, uh, it doesn't stutter very much, so it's relatively smooth for what it is. But I wouldn't call it like perfect experience, but it's fairly playable. So yeah, and I tried Unreal too, but that actually is usually more difficult on the hardware for some reason. It's less optimized, I think. Uh, runs runs a little bit poorer. So yeah, this is the Power Leap Renaissance 370S, and I do have plans for this card now. But that will probably be a separate video. But I figure what you could do instead of what it was intended to do was that were it was basically intended to replace your motherboard. I figured why do you have to replace your motherboard? Why can't you have two systems in one? So I built this with the CPU in mind at 600 megahertz and uh, to go in another system but that will require more parts that I don't have I have some some order so I expect at least a month before I can actually put this this in the system I want the way I want it so there will be a follow-up video that's the plan but other than that I think we're pretty much done with the card for now so we have done a full recap fixed uh, broken header and benchmarked benchmark it and it performed well roughly where I figure it would be so uh, other than the memory holding it back which is a unfortunate, unfortunate uh, design feature I suppose flaw so I'll leave it at that and thank you for watching and have a nice day